cloud. This meeting is being recorded. Awesome. Okay, let me make sure I can get the rocket in. Got it. And then we also have our mobile view over here. So uh, how would you like to start? Um, <clears throat> okay, so in preparation for this meeting, I went back through your report too. And um, I've got a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just quickly run through all the electronics that looks like you have three separate pieces separating nose cone payload and the rest of the rocket? Yeah, so is do, do you want us to actually go through and show you all of those? Sure, that's probably that's the easiest. Yeah, so the first, so here's the rocket we're going to be doing painting later this week on it. Um, but this is the nose cone over here. And can we uh, make that full screen? Um, oh, would you like that? Is that better? So let, let me, I'll go ahead and remove the. Uh, there we go. Yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, yep. So, yeah, the nose cone, and this is the same system we've been using for a few years now. Um, but the the nose cone has its own eBay, which sits right in there. Um, there's a clocking pin that we use in order to keep it in place. And if I can actually unscrew it, um, it has its own uh, independent recovery. Mitchell, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the actual electronics we're using in the nose cone? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so um, the nose cone has a tele GPS GPS module as well, um, which is um, COTS as well as two COTS light computers, a Easy Mini and a Raven 4. Um, the Easy Mini um, the the Easy Mini is the primary and the um, Raven 4 is the secondary um, just because we can set delays on the Raven 4 and not on the Easy Mini. So at Apogee, the Easy Mini eject, um, ejection charge goes off and then half a second after Apogee, the Raven 4 um, goes off. That is the Raven 4 with um, the custom Case Rocket Team um, breakout board right there. Um, we are using... Um, batteries yeah. um lithium ion batteries um for this and then on the other side um that's our gps module um tele gps yeah, the module easy mini is currently not installed but it goes here and we've checked it um we're waiting on a new easy mini um yeah. because uh yeah. the last one broke during our test um but yeah so um additionally so at apogee oh mitchell you're frozen for us um can you hear me now yeah yeah, yeah. okay i really hope my wi-fi does not cut out throughout this and I'm getting a notice. Okay, wait like two minutes while I walk to a better area. If, if someone can explain um, nose cone recovery, that would be helpful. Wait, Mitchell, can you say that again? If if Garrett can explain nose cone recovery right now, that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, so uh, once the nose cone comes off for the majority of the descent, it is the chute is bundled in the fire blanket, which is held on with a zip tie that will get cut by uh, cuts, brown cord cutters uh, for the majority of the descent. Uh, it should fall at about 78 feet per second. And then when we deploy the parachute fully, uh, the ground hit velocity should be 25.8 feet per second. Yeah, so if we can move on to the um, main eBay now, uh, this is our upper body tube. It houses the payload over here. And then uh, our this section will separate um, well. Uh, and then this is our eBay. 
Okay. So uh, inside here, I'll pull this apart. We have our um, main eBay electronics. If you want to talk about that, uh, Mitchell. Okay. So the main eBay also has two um, COTS light computers, another Raven 4 and another Easy Mini, um, as well as a COTS GPS module of a featherweight GPS. We have done, te we are using carbon fiber tubes and we have done testing with the featherweight to check that um, all radio frequency um, for the GPS works through that. We have a fiberglass nose cone um, for the um, no for the nose cone and we have a tele GPS through that so we don't have to worry about our F opaqueness um, for the nose cone but so what happened that's pretty much our electronics bay we so yeah have... if I can I'll talk about this for a second here's our um, our GPS over there and then on the other side we have our Raven uh, another spot for an easy mini um, some uh, temporary cable harnesses which we'll figure out there and then this is also our uh, Tendi Descendi Duo. This is our SRAD um, dual redundant uh, main deployment mechanism, which we talked about in the paper as well. It's the uh, same one that we used last year that worked really well. So we are using it again this year. Okay. Um, cool. Ken, should we move over to the um, to the payload? Do you have any questions about what we've shown you so far? Um, yeah, it's actually pretty hard to see because uh, <clears throat> the mobile camera is just a small image. It's not the primary in your broadcast. Oh, I, don't um, know. I, be I believe. Oh, uh, who's who's you played? It's me. It's this computer. Uh, there okay. we go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So 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 let's. Okay. So let's show you this. So this is the um the nose cone with the uh, Raven and the Easy Money, as we said. Then here's the main with the Raven and the spot for the Easy Mini, the Tendi to Sendi Duo, the Cost GPS. Um, yeah, is there any other part of this you, you wanna see before we move on? Um, you guys flew that uh, release mechanism last year. Yeah, so we, we flew that last year, the, the to Sendi Duo. and we've tested it a, a few times since then as well. Um, I don't and remember I'll, I'll seeing to... that. Can you just explain how it's redundant? Sure. Yeah, uh, oh, Russell, do you, do you wanna do you wanna explain that or Garrett? Yeah, I was just gonna jump in and say um, this version um, is different because th this one has more redundancy um, compared to what two years and three years ago we used. But the team has been using the same thing. This is basically just a double version um, of what the team has been using, I think, for about five years now. Um, so they can talk a little more about the redundancy, but just some. I would call this flight heritage at this point. It's pretty pretty well proven. We've never had a problem with it. Yeah, so the, the redundancy comes out of the fact that we have two different charges that we deploy, and we tie a specific type of knot. I think it's called the Brunian link um, between uh, those two redundant systems. So when you pull either of the pins, uh, even if only one of them is pulled, the entire knot comes undone and the main can deploy. OK, great. Um, Okay, so the payload here is, uh, we're still doing a little bit more electronics testing on it. So uh, we have the breadboard set up right now. Um, this is the payload frame over here. Um, and then you have the redundancy that we have with the payload. Uh, we have a Raven 4, which is on one of the uh, electronics sleds. Do you want to bring the electronics yeah. right here? Um, so while Chris is doing that, um, our redundant system, we were originally planning to use an SRF flight computer, but because of time constraints, we weren't able to prioritize that. Um, and so we have a uh, SRAD power distribution board, um, which has two uh, voltage regulators for um, the servos as well as our cameras. And then it also has our SRAD Nyclones cord cutter, which this is our prototype version, but we have the, um, the one for the actual payload fabricated and they're inside over there. One of them. Oh, one of them. And then this is also uh, redundant if either of the cord cutters work uh, then the the main parafoil will release. And then um, the kind of, it's a little bit of a silly system here, but we have a second raven. raven. So yeah, we're using a second Raven for- um, Barometric altitude detection. Yeah, for barometric altitude detection. And then we have for each of the four events, we have those 
connected to different behaviors on this artificial nano, which then is able to control our servers, night frame cutters, and cameras um, based off of, of the power distribution board. Basically, the Arduino nano and the second wave of Bora together are acting like a simplified version of the SLAB flight computer that we were hoping to develop for this year. And then I'll move on to here. This is our payload sled. The entire thing comes out so that we can work on the electronics independently. Um, and then where does the uh, other Raven 4 mount? So one Raven 4 goes right here. This is the uh, redundant one. This is the one that's only that's connected directly to the Nikon cutter through these uh, uh, crimps that you can see here. Uh, then the second Raven 4 goes here. And it went from the so yeah, so these two sections detach to make installation really easily. Um, yeah. So those are our three sections, each one of them. Oh, this also shows where's the place for the GPS. Yeah, so we have a, a spot for a GPS that's right against a um, polycarbonate, oh, against this polycarbonate uh, shield because um, we were having issues last year with uh, making sure that the GPS inside the payload was getting, was able to send a signal out. And so we made sure that there wasn't any large aluminum or steel like metal pieces in the way this year. Um, yeah. And is there anything else we can uh, we can show you for electronics, or do you want us to move on to something else? No, let's move on to the airframe. That looks good. Okay. Cool. Um, so uh, Andrea was our composites lead, so I think she can talk. Uh, to this more. Is there any part you want to see specifically first? Uh, no. Okay, Let's so Andrea, take it away. It. Andrea? Okay. Um, so what we're looking at now is our fiberglass nose cone and a carbon fiber coupler. So essentially the fiberglass uh, nose cone was created from a 3D printed the mold that we essentially made based on our CAD. And then we 3D printed that in four sections, put it together. And then to surface prep it beforehand, we did uh, some Bondo on top of it to smooth the surface and then a gel, a gel coat so that the epoxy would not stick as well. And then to do the layup, we, we did a kind of a fiber, we used four different diameters of fiberglass sleeve uh, across the entire OGI geometry in order to do so. And then we did two layers of fiberglass on top of it uh, in order to kind of, to achieve the targeted thickness that we wanted of around 50 thou. And then the fiberglass was chosen. All the other layups were done in carbon fiber. As explained earlier, we chose fiberglass for the nose cone in order to uh, essentially circumvent the issues that we were having with GPS through carbon fiber. So we chose the fiberglass nose cone for that. And then after it was fully cured, we essentially broke the carbon, sorry, the 3D print from the inside of the, the layup. And then from there, we just sanded the surface uh, to make it nice and smooth. And then uh, it'll get a paint job as well. And then after we did the, after it was completely cured and cut to size, um, all the holes were were drilled in for the ports to the, the nose cone eBay and, uh, like, like the screw switches that we have on it. And then for the coupler uh, that's on the bottom of the nose cone, uh, this was made from essentially how we did all our straight tubing was we bought aluminum man uh, aluminum tubes that were hollow, uh, six inches in diameter. And we were, we used a lathe in order to turn it down to our, our diameter that for our targeted diameter. For the outer tubes, that inner diameter is 5.65 inches. Um, and then for the couplers, the inner diameter of those is 5.55 uh, inches nominally. So we turned these aluminum tubes down to the targeted size. And then our targeted wall thickness for the tubes was 50 thou. And so we aimed to, that's kind of how we determined the sizes of the, the mandrels. From there, once those were fully turned and turned to size, we surface prep that using uh, acetone to clean it, uh, a partol paste wax to essentially buff it in a few layers. And then we used a graphite lubricant spray uh, essentially until it was completely opaque on the surface of the aluminum mandrel. From there, we put a, a layer of mylar to separate it between the graphite lubricant and the carbon fiber. And then after that, the layup was done on top of the mylar 
uh, using a, a fiberglass system 2000 lab, laminating epoxy uh, with a two hour pot life uh, in order to be able to do this with enough time to do it properly. For the layup itself, we used a flat carbon fiber fabric. We used one layer of 6K uh, carbon fiber weave on the bottom and then two layers of, of 3K carbon fiber fabric on top. And we essentially uh, used that fat flat fabric and wrapped it around the mandrel. So those were the layers that we did for the actual composition of the tubes. That same layup was done for the couplers as well. So all the layups are uniform in that composition. And then after they were fully cured, uh, mm -hmm. kind of their uh, tentative kind of curing time is like 12 to 18 hours before it can kind of get like handled for the most part. So after 18 hours, we were able to do other uh, tubes, but after around three days, when it's fully cured, we were able to cut them to size uh, using a horizontal bandsaw. Uh, and, um, with especially Andrea, if I can jump in, um, for the couplers specifically, uh, after sanding them down to size, uh, we found them to be a little bit too thin. Um, and so under the recommendation of Russell, uh, who's our flyer of record, we did an internal layup on each one of the couplers as well. So that was done similarly to the first. If you want, we can go into the details of the weaves and the epoxy that we used. Um, but that added a, a significant amount. And I think our couplers are all somewhere between 75 and uh, 95 thou. Andrea, you can correct me if you know the specific number. Yeah, on average, they're, um, they're 80 thou thickness. But essentially, in the inside, as he was explaining, uh, after we sanded them to size and to, for them to fit into their respective outer tubes, uh, we realized that they were far, far too thin. And so we reinforced them using an internal layup, which is composed of four layers of 3K fabric. And we did basically a similar process that we did with the outer tubes of wrapping it around, except it was essentially reverse. And then we reinforced it using kind of a, a vacuum bagging technique, which involved using a vacuum tube, um, kind of going in the middle of the of the tube. And then when we pulled vacuum, it essentially compressed the the layup along the the walls of the, the tube, essentially allowing for it to be fully not really stuck and reinforced. And then that allowed for much thicker uh, couplers, which we feel a lot better about uh, seeing as uh, they can kind of withstand a lot more load. So very happy about that. And then the tube, the lower tube, uh, due to the limitations in our manufacturing and like and time constraints, we used a 30 inch long aluminum mandrel to construct all our outer tubes. Uh, and because of this, our lower body tube which is nominally a length of 49 inches long, uh, we essentially separated into two parts. And so the part, the way that we did it was we made a 20 inch long outer tube, a 29 inch long tube. And then in, the, in between these two, we did an 18 inch long um, coupler that was uh, also reinforced. So we did 18 inch long coupler in between and then an epoxy job in between the two uh, using the same system 2000 epoxy, laminating epoxy. Um, so that essentially created the 40 inch, 49 inch long lower body tube that we needed. And none of the internal structures interfered with this, uh, with the coupler being there. Uh, so it led to a very, a pretty strong uh, lower body tube that we're very confident in. Yeah. Okay, should we move on to the uh, rashing? And do you have any more questions for um, the, these parts before we move on to the thin pan or should we do that first? Uh, no, the tubes and the couplers look very good. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Say that again. The tubes and the coupler uh, look very good, and the nose cone. Cool, nice I appreciate. Work. It. Yeah, this was a uh, it was a, a really fun process to get to finally make these. Um, yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's talk thin can. So for the thin can, uh, it's essentially built off of a boat tail that we did similarly to the nose cone. So we 3D printed a mold um, for the size that we, we designed. And then we did a very similar uh, surface prep process on that with Bondo and a gel coat on top of that. And then from there, we did the same layup of one layer of 6K carbon fiber and two layers of 3K carbon fiber on top of that mold. But we did it with sleeves instead of weaves just to account for the um, the geometry that isn't just straight, it has a, a slight angle to it. And then 
from there, after that was fully cured and cut to size, we did the fin can um, layup, tip to tip layup on top of that. So what we did for the fins, actually I'll talk kind of specifically about the fins. We, those are composed of a quarter inch G10 sheet uh, that was laid up by independently. So that had two layers of 6K carbon fiber weave on top of each side of it uh, to kind of achieve a thickness of, of 0.31 inches. And then from there, those were cut like with the water jet and the bevel was machined with a, a CNC uh, mill. And then once those were fully done and sanded, uh, the boat tail and the fins were surface prepped uh, to then complete the tacking of the fins. We did that using a five minute epoxy and a two part wooden jig uh, to kind of keep them in place uh, as we were doing it. So we also aligned them uh, using a combination square and made sure everything was very straight. And so those were all essentially epoxied at once. And then after those were tacked and like left in the the, the jig overnight, uh, we started going about doing fillets on the fin can. So those fillets were made using an aero epoxy with glass bubbles mixed in to increase its viscosity and strength. And so the boat tail, sorry, the fillets were done using a one inch radius tool uh, to make them a lot thicker than we did last year. Um, last year we experienced um, some issues with our fin can. And so we decided to reinforce them a little bit using a much larger, larger radius for the fillets. Um, so those were completed and then left to cure for about 12 hours before doing any other uh, fillets from there. And then once those were completely cured, we surface prepped the entire surface uh, using a 220 grit and then also shaped the, the fillets as well um, using some, yeah, we, you, we fill it them, sorry, we shaped the fillets. And then from there, um, we essentially did the, the tip to tip layout process, which was essentially, there was a rectangular sheet of six cake fabric, but on top of the fillets of each of the fillets. And then the sheets that you see covering the fins and the core of the fins was were laser cut uh, to the shape that we needed them to be. And then we did a two 6K layers underneath and then one 3K layer on top. The two 6K layers only cover uh, the main kind of the middle area of the fins. So the, they don't go through the bevel. It's the upper layer that it goes through across the entire fin um, span. And so those were kind of cut at like 45, 90, 45 degree angles um, to allow for multi-axial strength of the, and yeah, multi-axial strength of the uh, the carbon fiber. And then from there, that was all used, um, that was all done using a three to one uh, laminating epoxy, US composites. And then all of this was put in a vacuum bag. Before it was put in the vacuum bag, we had a layer of peel ply on top of it and then some breather cloth as well so that it wouldn't puncture the bag and it would be able to uh, be a layer to take up a lot of the epoxy. And then this was all put in a vacuum bag that was left on for about 24 hours. So each of those fin cans were done uh, one, one at a time. So that's kind of how we went about doing that. And then afterwards, that after that was completely done, we sanded it to to just kind of finish it up a little bit. We didn't sand the any of the fillets. It was mainly just like the end parts that kind of provided a little bit of a lip. So we didn't sand any of the, like the fillets or the actual like fin can itself to reinforce the strength of the to not have to hinder any of the strength of the CF whatsoever on the fin on the fin can whatsoever. So it was only kind of sand to sand to finish. And then the ends were sanded yeah. perpendicular as well since it has to interface with this spring right here in order to interface with the structure, the internal structure, these are uh, bolted on. So these th both ends were sanded perpendicular. And, yeah. So I was uh, pleased to hear that you used five minute epoxy instead of hot glue to tack your fins in place. Yeah. Since the report says hot glue, I think uh, I might have made a comment about that in my review. Yeah, you definitely did. That was my bad. I was looking out um, at what we've done previously, and I, I pulled the wrong. That, 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 yeah, we, Andrea, just to confirm, we did five-minute epoxy for, for the tagging? Yes. 
Hot yeah, Hot Glue um, is a vestige of four years ago um, where the root wasn't actually hot glued. The just like a dot at the front and a dot at the back were hot glued while the fillet set. Um, no one ever put epoxy under the fins four years ago. I don't know why they did that. I was a freshman at the time. Um, but yeah, that was just, yeah, it was an investment that we thankfully don't do anymore. <laughs> um, okay, can you, uh, where does the um, aft plane of the nozzle fit relative to the aft of the bow tail? Um, Mitchell, you want to talk? So, is we have a yeah. uh, I can talk more about the um, force transfer as well if you want, but we have a uh, yeah. Mitchell, is it, is it uh, you want to talk about this? Do, yes, okay. So, within yeah. the um, bow tail and lower body tube, there is a motor tube that um, sits in there that the motor casing actually slides into. Um, um, wait, Chris, before you do, is the um, spacer on right now? Okay. Yeah. Um, so how, so how this works is the motor tube, the yeah. motor tube has a bunch of um, center, center ring bulkheads um, epoxied onto it, um, including the bulkhead that both the bow tail and lower body tube bolts onto. Um, so they act, so all of it is combined, which is, it works very well for the air brakes mechanism that we had intended to use and are still is part of the rocket, as well as um, just um, being a structural part of the actual rocket and supporting um, the thrust transfer and everything. So at the top of the motor tube, there is a bulkhead that has a threaded rod attached to it that sits there-ish. Um, so the um, motor so the motor actually threads into the um, threaded rod there. Um, unfortunately, we had to because because we had to sand all of the tubes to be perpendicular um some we sanded it a bit too much so we had to decrease the we decreased the length of what we had actually intended to um design and manufacture therefore um we had to cut some of the we had to cut some of the parts the internal components to length however we forgot to cut the threaded rod to length um because of that the motor casing sat this much outside of the rocket and, and we had intended for all force transfer to go through the um, boat tail. So with that, because the casing, um, the lip of the casing sat about an inch off from where the, um, from the boat tail, all of the thrust would go through the threaded rod, which we did not do FEA for because of that. And we did not trust that to be strong enough because of that. We cut a um, G12, um, G12 motor tube, four inch diameter, um, just fiberglass tube and put have put it on the edge of the motor casing so that we slide it on before we actually insert the motor casing into the rocket and then we thread on the motor casing into the threaded rod and that that gap that you see right there does not exist it is there the motor casing the mode the right, right. there is no there when we actually thread it on there will be no gap between and all of the compressive forces will go from the um yeah. lip of the motor to the spacer to the yeah. um okay so that shifts your cg of the motor aft relative to your open rocket model uh yes we have so... updated the newest open rocket um, up, I updated in the paper the open rocket file and the RAS arrow file um, with this new change. And in in what your oh your third in, report? Uh, in the paper that we submitted um, earlier today. Okay. So you're using the threaded rod as your only uh, motor retention. Uh. Yes, we are using the threaded rod as a motor retention, and then force transfer is through the spacer. So yeah, and then so, uh, we have a motor tube as well that the motor yes. is sitting inside the door. So uh, how are you going to keep the motor from rotating versus the threaded rod? The, the you're not at I, all worried about the motor unscrewing from the rod? Uh, no. In pre many previous years, we have had this exact same um, connection method of having the motor, threading the motor onto the um, threaded rod. And 
there have been no problems of the motor actually coming of coming undone rotating out as long as we fed it correctly okay i've seen them come out in person so uh we'll go with the way you've got it engineered okay um can we do, can, would you recommend that they put uh like any blue tape that it has more of a friction fit with the motor tube during installation or I mean, is there anything else you would recommend to help it from backing out a little bit? Well, the motors I use are uh, designed a little bit differently. They use a radial set of set screws to hold the uh, retaining rings in. And I can run a, I can either back one of those out into a hole through the motor tube, which then prevents it from rotating. Got it. Um, you won't be able to do that with this motor. It's a CTI, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. CTI OB400. Uh, by the way, while I think of it, do you have the motor? Uh, yeah. Yes. This is we have it the motor at our... Last year that we weren't able to use. It is, it is in our possession right now. Yeah. So we don't have to worry about oh. shipping and stuff. Well, yeah, it's not that. It's just CTI is not in a very good position and they're they're backing off on a lot of motor orders right now so a lot of teams if they don't right now if the team doesn't have a cti motor in hand they're probably we, scrambling we, to try and find an aerotech we we, yeah. we own the motor already it's it's at our advisor's um place yeah, i've been waiting i've been waiting on the l1350 from tim wildman since black friday yeah Good luck with that. Yeah, I'm getting that thing. <laughs> yeah, he owes me some special tubes and a coupler for a project I'm flying in, in balls uh, in late September, and I haven't seen. And that's nine weeks. Nine weeks ago, I ordered those. If you're, you're going to be at balls oh, this year, I'll, see you I'll make sure to say hi. I'm sorry, say that again. I said, if you're going to be at balls this year, um, I'm running a I'm running a small competition. I'm sorry to take up the time. We're launching um on the Loki M1378s. We got like eight people launching them on min diameters, so be sure to look out for that. It'll be a it'll be an interesting day at least. Well, I've been going for I don't know 15 years, so um, I'll be there. I'm flying a, a P2P two stage. Wow, I'm excited to see that one. Okay, uh, what, can, what cool. can we show you next? Really cool. um, let's just walk through your recovery. Attachment point, dock cords. Yeah, uh, Derek, do you, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. so uh, we probably want to start at the upper eBay bulkhead because that's really where most of the main recovery stuff happens from. So from this U-bolt, uh, the shot cord comes off. The next, first thing on the shot cord is the main parachute. During most of descent, that will be in its deployment bag, which is also attached to that U-bolt. Uh, then there is a short line that goes from the U-bolt through the end of the deployment bag through the main parachute's quick link into the tendy descendy, which holds those all together and in place while we're falling under drogue. Um, from our testing, that has reliably held the parachute in together. And then when that deploys, it's come out very easily. So uh, from our testing, that should work just fine for uh, deploying main, keeping it undeployed when we don't want it to be deployed and all that. So yeah, and... these are the, these are the tendy pins for the, our dual redundant SRAT tendy descender. Um, so you can see we have e-matches that that's still from the last test. Um, we pack these with uh, 0.1 grams of black powder, and then there's two of them uh, on the same. Each one is equipped with two pins, and then they're, they're dual redundant in that sense. Uh, okay, what size are your quick links? Oh, you have these? So that's the subtle one. Where's the quick link? Uh, 
Oh, okay. The, the quick links are currently tangled up. Garrett, do you remember the sizes on those? I don't remember exactly. I remember, I think there are thousand pound ones. Um, but I mean, we, we should be able to see on those what they say. I know the one that is on the main uh, recovery bulkhead is larger than the other ones. Yeah, so these um, are the our lines got a little bit tangled when we were packing up um, meet the test. So sorry for, for that, but these are the, Jared, do you want to describe what each of these is for? Um, so I th believe the one on the main parachute is going to also be the bigger size. Um, this, and we just put a smaller one on there for testing purposes because it was honestly the first thing that we grabbed, but the, um, so from the bottom, the one that attaches to the main recovery bulkhead and on the main parachute are the bigger ones. Uh, you can probably read what those are rated for on them. Yeah, I'm not able to see anything on them. Okay. Um, um but yeah. And then above the main parachute one is a smaller one for the drogue chute. And then at the very top of this line attaches to the payload tube and a bulkhead in there. And that's also one of the smaller ones because that's a once the payload's gone, that tube is very light. So this is the uh, the bulkhead inside there. I'm not sure if you can see that we have um so that's just the payload quick link. And then uh, Mitchell, what type of connector do we have in there in the payload bulkhead? Uh, that is an eye bolt. So we just have a quick link attached there and so when separation occurs, we have both sides. Is it is the eye bolt the forged eye bolt closed or is it a bent wire eye bolt? It's forged closed, I think. Um yeah, it's a closed yeah. loop. Yeah. And we actually got a new one for the uh for the nose cone just now. So the fat one is just temporarily that we knew as well this one was coming in the mail. That's the yeah. Other. So so the, the nose cone currently we have a temporary bent one in and then after we hop off this call, I'm going to install the this this new force one. Um, okay, so this is another point. I'm I'm not uh, I'm giving you uh, experience, not directive. Okay. I lost a uh, a booster half of a rocket at balls last year because an eye bolt that had no way to unspin spun out. Hmm. So um, that's the one case in the last 10 years that I haven't safety wired the eye bolt to an attachment point off to the side to prevent the eye bolt from unspinning, from unthreading. So wherever you have a single point with an eye bolt or an eye nut, I suggest you consider how you might keep it from spinning. Yeah, so, so usually we lock tight our uh our single points attachments like the the I I nuts in. Um Mitchell, were we planning on doing anything in addition to lock tighting them this year? Uh right, no, we have our only planned to lock use blue Loctite on all um connections. If you recommend another method, we'll look into that, Ken. Well, you can use Loctite. Just make sure that you prepare the two surfaces properly mm -hmm. relative to the directions for the Loctite. Um, how are you attaching, on the left of this picture, the eBay, how is that being attached to the airframe? Um, so it sits inside our eBay coupler between these two bulkheads. Um, and then uh, the bottom one has jam nuts that we put in um during installation and the top has jam nuts as well um this entire so, cup board has our switch band epoxy on and sits between the lower and uh no, maybe all the, the jam nuts and all connections radio on the radio. top bulkhead um of the top upper ebay bulkhead that have all of the recovery um have everything recovery wise have already been jam nutted on and they're also loctite on both of those as well. And then we have four radial uh, bolts on the bottom and then the shear pins on top. Okay, uh, let's go back to um, 
the shock cords. So one of the things that you guys um, should consider, uh, we have data that show that you could, that during the Apogee recovery event, your system could experience between 20 and 50 Gs of deceleration. So you need to consider the loads that you're going to be getting on the shock cords and the attachment points. Yeah. And I'm seeing knots in your shock cords. Um, this um, is Kevlar. Going to be the, the final shock cord that we use. And I think we, I'm not sure if we put it in uh, this year's paper, but we, uh, we've experimented with a lot of different knot types before. And uh, we use uh, a few ones that have been tested. Okay. Like, 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 like Alpine and a uh, scaffold. An Alpine and a scaffold. Knot. Alpine for midline knots and the scaffold for any line knots. Okay. Um, you still lose strength out of, um, with any time you have a, a, a knot, you're going to lose strength. Okay. So just factor, factor that into your calculations. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Um, I've switched. Uh, I've switched entirely away from Kevlar because of its. Um, the problem it has is a sharp bend, as you might see at the edge of a body tube. Oh, yeah. And um, I've switched to a material called Dyneema, which is used in um, sailing, and mm -hmm. it's actually superior to. It's another synthetic fiber, but its performance is better than Kevlar. And I use. Um, Splices everywhere. I splices primarily at the end. Um, and does the, um, does the Dyneema have um, like heat resistance like Kevlar does for the black powder charges? I didn't hear the very first part of that question. Does it have? Does the Dyneema have heat resistance um, like the like the Kevlar does? If it's next to a black powder charger, does it get kind of melty like the nylon does? Um. I can't give you any specific data on that, and I use um, CO2, so I I don't have any direct experience to give you on that one. Um, I also got I haven't used um, Quick Links in probably a decade. I'm currently using Soft Shackles, and if you haven't done any, if you haven't heard of a Soft Shackle or used them before, you might take a look. They're lighter, way stronger, and um, quick links. You can buy them on uh, Amazon. Cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at those. Um, so that, I, I'll tell you right now that in the safety inspection, if you're using the size that I just saw, those look like 3 16 and these are a quarter or 5 16 for the large one. The quarters are, are going to be questioned. Yeah, I, I think we're using, we're using larger ones across the board. This was what we just used for our ejection tests. Um, okay. So, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, nose cone recovery is next in recovery. So we have the, the nose cone, like we mentioned earlier, is uh, the parachute is wrapped up in the fire blanket here. Um, then all of that, uh, we have a, a redundant torque cutter system, which we deploy at 1,500 feet. Um, and uh, yeah, it recovers independently. It has its own dual redundant stuff, as we talked about there. Garrett, do you want to talk more about the structure of actually how all the uh, quick links and cables go together? On the nose cone is pretty simple. Uh, yeah. The line just attaches to the eye bolt on that bulkhead, and then the other end is just straight up to the drogue. Um, and the fire blanket's just on the line in the middle of it uh, because it, we're just keeping it wrapped in the fire blanket. We don't need any other knots for like a drogue and a main or anything. So it's pretty much just a line with two loops. Yeah, yeah, that's straightforward. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, um, the payload? let's talk about your air brakes. Oh, air brakes. So the simple the simple answer, which I think is going to make uh, your life a lot easier, is that we're not planning on deploying the air brakes this year. We're using them. We weren't able to finish fabricating the flaps in time, and so they're going to be uh, passengers on on this flight, and we're hoping to, to retrofit it after comp. 
Yeah, that does make it easier. Okay. Yeah. Um, were you able to do a test flight? Um, we were not able to do a test flight. Yeah, there there was rain on the the last weekend that we were trying to to get to. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not just you guys. We had Mississippi State at our local club two two launches in a row, mm -hmm. and they actually got their rocket racked. And we were ready to um, elevate it, and I'm not kidding. A tornado warning. Oh my gosh. Came across. And so while we might have been able to get it launched, they would have been recovering in potentially a tornado. So um, they pulled it off and headed back. And that's a 12-hour drive for them Jeez. just to visit the launch site we have. And I, I also uh, mentor the UTD team. Uh, they're flying today, actually, uh, down in, in Hearn. Okay. But I couldn't get back in time to do this review. So guess who takes priority? Um, um, yeah, okay. So, so yeah, as then, an um, we're planning on having a test flight just because of the timing of everything. Um, yeah. But we've All right, been, and you've dropped the, we've been you've a charges. test flight over the last three years. It's been frustrating. Yeah. And but you have done a uh, recovery charge test, ground test. Correct. So we did a ground uh, ground test for that. Um, we did three different tests. Even though we've uh, done the the tendy descendy before, we tested those just to make sure that the flight computers uh, would deploy those correctly. Um, we then did a the the main uh, the main body ejection um, that worked the first time with the calculated two and two and a half uh, grams. Um, so, so two for the main and then two and a half for the back. Level. And then for the nose cone, um, we, on the first day, we uh, tried it with two and with four grams. Uh, it ended up not working for either. It turns out that our bulkhead that was holding in the payload um, was spinning out. So we, we epoxied this, uh, this bulkhead is now epoxied in. Um, and we tested it the next, uh, later that week with, um, uh, I think three grams. Um, and then direct, yeah, three grams. So we're doing three grams for the uh, primary, three and a half for the uh, redundant. Okay, that all sounds very good. My only comment would be, I will generally go 50% up for the backup charges. Okay. If you guys are comfortable with half a gram, okay. The, um, you know, the phrase is either blow it out or blow it up. Is it the first charge doesn't? First charge doesn't get the, the payload out or the recovery out, the rocket separated. Since you have vents and you'll be bleeding that pressure, a secondary charge of about the same size is going to be marginal. Okay. And if it doesn't come out, the whole thing's destroyed, going to be destroyed anyway. Yeah. And with those tubes, you'll never fail those tubes with a BP charge, right? I mean, you'd need a stick of dynamite. To blow those things up. Really? They have a lot of hoop strength. Okay, so yeah, so we, we can, I, if, if you'd recommend it, we can do three grams for the backup on the uh, main and um, either four or, yeah, I think four probably as a backup for the nose cone. That would be my recommendation, but it's your rocket. Um, okay, so um, let me ask this. What is, uh, how confident are you of a successful flight at Spaceport? 80%, um, 90%? I think you'll get different answers depend, uh, out of us depending on who you ask, but uh, I'm feeling pretty confident. Um, Mitchell, how are you feeling? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say around 80. Um, two weeks ago, I would say zero because I was we wouldn't have had this rocket ready two weeks ago um but um with all the work that the team has put in we have an actual rocket that is assembled that has every part of this rocket has been tested in some way either in used in previous years or, uh, an improved version of something that has been used in previous years or actually been tested this year um so as confident slightly less confident than as confident as you can be um, but 80, 80-ish percent, I'd say. All right. How about Andrea?
Andrea, are you there? Yeah. Um, after seeing the ejection tests that we conducted, they were very successful. Uh, that was kind of my my margin as to how confident I would feel um, about this rocket. Um, after seeing some very successful ejection recovery tests, um, I think I feel a lot more confident about our success of this rocket. Um, seeing the the airframe really come together uh, quite recently has been a, a joy to see, seeing as this is our first time really doing our own uh, tubing. Like really this whole airframe is, is, is rad for us. So like very, feeling very good about it and everything kind of seeing everything come together, um, feeling a lot more confident about it. So uh, obviously a test flight would have been nice to kind of see that it actually will would go up and, and everything, but uh, definitely feeling probably like 80, 85% confident. Yeah, Ken, just okay, to, so... uh, if, if I can add, um, oh, uh, we, this is this is yours the first year that we've done fully custom SRAD tubes, nose cone, boat tail. We also sewed our main and drogue this year as well. So that's been a, a, a pretty big jump for the team. Um, so, yeah. Can you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I just thought somebody was talking. So oh. the the only the only real um, well, a couple of comments here. When I do L3 certifications as a TAP, I'll always tell the um, the flyer a couple of things. One, while you're assembling it, have somebody that stands out in front and fends away anybody asking questions. So you need to be really focused. You know, the whole team focused and working together when you're assembling this thing. And the second thing is, and you'll be in a, there'll be a lot of go fever and a lot of rush at the pads. Once the igniter's in, step back, look at the rocket top to bottom and think it through. If there's a little voice on your shoulder that's saying, wait a minute, I don't feel good about something, listen to it. Yeah. So with these rockets, I mean, basically you're flying a level three rocket with a very complex recovery system. The up parts tend to be pretty easy. I mean, your airframe's gonna stay together, the fins are gonna stay on. It'll be a very impressive launch. The downside is the hard part. Up is easy, down is hard. You'll see um, failures on the on level three certifications um, are tilted way toward fa failure recovery systems. And you've got three independent recovery systems in this rocket, right? Nose cone, yeah. payload, and your main airframe, which gives you opportunity for three times the entertainment. So, I what I'm what I'm seeing right now where we are from the competition, you guys are going to be fine. I'm expecting this this to me looks like it'll be a successful flight, uh, and I'll be looking forward to it. Um, you know, anytime you're flying, you know, an O motor to 30k, you know, they're pretty cool flights. Uh, so, do you have any questions for me about how the event will run? or what what we'll do out there yeah so the the first kind of big question i have um is relating to let me unspotlight um so the kind of the biggest question i have first is um about the pre-registration that they're doing new this year i was wondering how that was going to work um and how kind of if like i assume you recommend that we go through with that um but i knew that that's i know that that's new for the competition Okay, so how many of your team were at the event last year? Um, I think about yeah. half of us. Okay, so do you remember that long line on the, uh, what was it, the east side of the convention center waiting to get into registration? No more, we're not doing that. <laughs> so there'll be a document that will be distributed as we get closer to the competition that will have maps of the convention center a layout of the process that you'll go through, but I can give you the highlights here. When we open the convention center, probably eight o'clock on Monday, the teams will be able to enter with your rockets 
from the southwest doors and go straight into the convention hall and set up. No waiting for registration to be done. Meanwhile, one person from the team will go register. You know, Ben probably, you know, team lead. And that way, they'll only be, you know, basically, I mean, worst case, 130 people in that room instead of 1,700, right? Um, the pre-registration, we have to check waivers at Spaceport that they've been signed, TRA numbers for everybody going downrange. Everything's been paid. I don't know. We're trying to get all of that pre-checked before you show up so that we can simplify the registration process. So hopefully you'll be able to just, you know, when you get up to the desk, you give them your team number and the university. We look you up and basically check a box and give you the, the goodie bags you walk away with and you're done. Now, the next thing at the convention center, you might remember waiting for safety inspection, people lining up in that hallway with their rockets. Yeah. We're not doing that this year. Yeah. We have bought a, um, a rocket event paging system, more commonly used in restaurants. And you'll go, when you're ready to be for safety review, you'll go check in and you'll get a pager. Yeah. Pager has supposedly a two mile range I have not checked them, but certainly you can go anywhere in the convention center or nearby, probably, and you know, walk, talk to other teams, do whatever you want to do, talk to the judges, and then you'll be paged when we're ready for safety inspection. That means we have a pair of L3s that can go through your safety review, so you don't need to wait. Trying to cut down all that congestion. Then uh, the judging will be uh, pretty much like last year. And again, we've got Monday and Tuesday in the convention center. When you get out to Spaceport and you're ready to go through final safety, you'll go check in and you'll get a pager. And, you know, when you're basically on deck, you'll get paged and you can come up and get your rocket inspected, final, and safe, final safety, and it'll be impounded. When you are ready to go to the pads, you'll go up to another station and sign in and get a pager. So the, all that crap we had last year of a thousand people sitting with their rockets waiting to get into the pad lines, we're not doing that. So when we're ready to fill out a salvo to go to the pads, you'll be paged. And you'll come pull your rocket and you'll be directed since you guys are flying solid You'll be, with an O, you're going to be on bank four of the solids. We're adding a bank in the solids. And you'll be in a particular lane. And we, we're redoing the parking out of the solid pads. So you'll basically, everybody comes out in caravan, and you'll pull right in, right in front of your bank. Um, nice. That seems so really we're, good. We're trying very hard. To, I'm trying very hard to keep people out of the sun and to allow people to go and do other things instead of sitting in the sun waiting for something to happen. And I've broken this, uh, I've given a gap between final safety and the pads. So, I mean, you might get inspected at, you know, we'll, I think we'll open safety at, at 6 a.m., and but you might not. Because of cloud cover, for example, you might not want to fly for a little bit. You could go grab some breakfast burritos or something, and when everybody's ready, you can come check in, and then it's you know first come first served like that. Nice. So, and uh, what else have we done? Oh, um, I was RSO last year, and I'm RSO this year, and I had to deal with being forced to use a weather station five miles away, which was problematic. So we have bought uh, weather stations, and there'll be a weather station at each of the pad banks and the cool. LTO. They are public. You'll have the URL, and you can be watching all the data from the weather station two and a half seconds delayed, because that's the pulse, that's the update rate. Um, and we'll also be, I'm working through the final safety rules with uh, Spaceport now, 
we will publish a guide for um, launch conditions, launch commit before the event. So we've got to follow TRA Unified Safety Code, which is fundamentally in this case, we're worried about cloud cover and uh, surface wind speeds. So, you know, the USC says we can't fly with um, higher than 20 mile an hour surface winds we're going um, more conservative. It'll be 18, and so we'll. And we're up, but we are opening the launch window earlier. Um, we're opening at 7 a.m. There might be a day because of stuff going on a white sands. We can't open until nine, but where our intention is to have the first salvos off at 7 a.m. and okay. we'll cycle. It's it's about a 75 minute cycle for the solids pads statistically from last year. Um. I need to have Ken, clear. Ken, I remember the question about the pads. Um, you said there's a new solids pad. Is that still is that still space so that all the different pads can set up? Like, is that still space so the new pad can set up if the other ones are launching, or is it red flags on the new one? Like, how's the space set up? Okay, so we have three banks: a two-stage bank, a hybrid bank, and then we are um, pad set, and then we have the solids group. Those three can operate independently. The range will be closed if you're trying to go to the solid pads, but you can still go to the hybrids or the two stage pads. And we're running five pads in each of four banks at the solids. And that allows us to keep the launch controllers closer to the rails. And we've done a lot of testing on igniters and response time of the launch control system and antenna pointing and stuff. And so we understand all of that much better than we did previously. And we know where the, we had some delays last year between, you know, launch and then you wait two or three seconds. And we know what those delays are and we're addressing it. So um, we shouldn't have that issue. The only potential challenge that I'm still working through is uh, depending on where your rocket lands, you may not be able to immediately go recover it because of ballistic impact zones. And um, the spaceport is being um, extremely sensitive to um, liability and anybody you know, getting injured. So this event is gonna be run tighter than um, any probably any other Tripoli event ever. Uh, let's see, weather stations. Oh, we are going to have an upward looking LIDAR system that will give us the cool. wind profile to 100,000 feet, which will be interesting data. We are, there's only one extreme case we're gonna, we would use that in the context of a launch commit decision. Um, this year, we're using it primarily to look for correlation between uh, basically kicking off the rail and um, upper level winds. I mean, most of it's gonna be, you know, right as you come off the rail. Uh, but that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, that's exciting you know, to I can't put know up, that data. Yeah, I can't put up weather balloons. And they won't let me fly a non-competition rocket to watch a smoke smoke trail. So, um, and our waiver's higher this year. So I had some issues last year with um, teams that were predicting too close to the waiver limit. I don't have that problem this year. So I, you know, all in all, I'm actually quite pleased with the way the event is shaping up. And uh, we'll be up on teams, probably an additional 20 teams from last year. Oh, awesome. Maybe a bit more. So yeah, I think you, we'll have. I, I wanted to just say that we're really grateful for all the work that, that you guys have been putting in. We've been kind of seeing it from the background, and Russell has been making sure that we uh, truly appreciate the scale and, and magnitude of, of the whole event and all this new data collection stuff. And, and that work is, I don't know, I, I'm really excited to, to be able to see it and to. Um, yeah, just, just for all the, the ease that comes out of that. Well, there are, I mean, if we talk philosophy, there are, you know, there are 100 volunteers that are involved with this event. And we're doing it because I'm retired now. 
you guys are the next generation that are coming up. And if we're going to maintain our technical dominance in the U.S., it's people like you that are going to have to be doing it. And Russell, he's a young guy, too. I'm, I'm the old retired guy. <laughs> so uh, it is Russell, a lot of work. It. This will be the uh, – this will be, I'm pretty sure, the largest event um, that's run in North America. Cool. Probably around the world. And if you want to see cool stuff, you come to balls. But that's a that's a different subject altogether. Awesome. Is I just want to make sure we're crossing our our T's and dotting our I's. Is there anything else you need from from us, Ken? Before we no, I, Can I ask I, a quick, just a quick question. Um, I don't know if we're. I actually don't know the development status, but we've been kind of background developing a base station that's effectively a computer and a large antenna stick, um, like a little a little tower. It's like 20 feet tall, I think. Um, are we allowed to deploy that at Spaceport? I don't know if it's for any this year or next year, but um, I just want to know if that's something that's allowed or that's something that you guys would recommend we don't mess with as far as being at Spaceport. Uh, coordinate the frequency that you're going to be working with, with MCC, and then you know, if you strap an antenna pole to um, one of the tent poles, I don't see a problem with that. Sounds good. Yeah, we just had some issues where we lost connection. Like we lost, um, we didn't we have connection to like some of our data downlink. So we figured a taller pole will help us. That was the plan. Um, so I just wanted to that that was all, all clear. Uh, that actually reminds me of another thing. You won't need to bring a tent or tables. We're putting up. I said they're 30 by 200 or 40 by 200 tents. Wow. They're these huge windproof circus style tents, and we're providing tables. So you'll need to find some chairs. But we had on Friday afternoon last year, we had a heavy wind come through that just demolished a whole bunch of the easy ups. And then we were there. We lost, they, two, we lost two tents. Yeah, and even even if they survive, we've got about 45% of the teams are foreign, which means they come in, buy an easy up, use it for three days, and then th leave it, throw it out. So we uh, we got a big grant from um, New Mexico Aerospace something or other consortium. The event the event won a prize as the best best event in New Mexico, including the the uh, New Mexico, the Albuquerque Balloon Festival. And that's, that's gotten us more um, sponsorship bucks. And we just put it all back into the competition. Okay, okay. That, that also make yeah. packing so much easier because we don't have to put three tents and a whole bunch of tables in the back of the car. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And I want to make sure I can uh, let let my leads get back to their uh, to their uh, weekend. But I, I really appreciate uh, you kind of sitting down and, and walking through the rocket with us. And um, we're excited to see you at, at Spaceport this summer. Yeah, and I hope you guys voted in the board election too. Yep. Okay. So uh, um, all right. Have a great weekend, guys. So, yeah, just pass the link into the video through the normal channel. Okay. And uh, I look I look forward to see you guys at Spaceport. Yeah. Bye all. Thank you. We'll see you. Thank